So while Aviv was talking, I kept adding slides. So I have to talk very quickly. And those of you who are not immunologists can ignore any of the details. It won't really matter. So this is something that's apparent to everybody because this is the, the sort of crux of the whole HCA, but also in the context of everything we've talked about. We have cells. We have lymph nodes that are tissues uh, that are among many tissues that these cells populate. And then we have many different lymph nodes, the different types throughout the body. They're mucosal immune tissues. They're all the things that are on the list that we just heard about. And the questions are, how do we go from the kinds of uh, ex vivo single cell analyses to what's going on in the tissue? How does it influence cell state and function? And what are the best methods for doing that? And so I concentrate on that. I'm going to tell you a few immunological stories. As those of you who have any even peripheral touching of the immune system, no, you wind up with these complex diagrams, and these cells all have, quote, lots of markers. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning we define them as putative subsets based on two, three, or four cell, usually cell surface staining parameters, occasionally a nuclear parameter. And how do you study that in tissues? Because until very recently, the answer was you did two or three color immunofluorescence. They were red, green, and maybe you got yellow, and that was about it. And people are doing 15 color flow or 40 color cytoff, and, and life gets complicated. So various labs have developed things. I'll start with what we've done, but I'm going to talk about other people's work as well, because I think that's important in this context. Uh, we decided we needed to get more complex in the tissue and get more quantitative. And so Mike Gurner spent years developing a method where we do staining uh, directly on tissue sections in, in 14 or so parameters at a time. I'll come back to uh, iterative versions of this later on. Uh, we can compensate within that just like you do for flow, create surface objects that retain all the fluorescence. That's basically flow data. And then go directly into flow cytometry software now to gate until we get quantitative information. But we keep XYZ coordinates if we're doing just a section. Uh, and we can keep going in Z if we're doing volumes, which we'll come back to later. And therefore, anything we gate here, we can identify in the tissue, which is really one of the things that you know, we really want to do here. And this does work with human samples. I'll show you an example in a moment. It works with antiphosphoprotein and anticytokine antibodies. So if you want to know cell state, you can get that information as well and relate it to the transcriptional state. Uh, and you get the function and phenotype. And so, those of you who don't look at uh, flow data, I'm going to show you one very quick thing, and I'm just going to erase the ones you don't look at. Here is a two-parameter flow analysis, this marker for B cells, this marker for T cells. Make these blue, make these red, tell the software to print them back in X, Y coordinates, and you get a picture of a lymph node with peripheral B cell follicles and a central T zone generated automatically out of that. Now you can just think about that going multiplex. It really matters that you do this. If we look by flow cytometry of dissociated cells or by what we call histocytometry, we get identical numbers for naive lymphocytes. That's wonderful. But if you add to that looking for dendritic cells, which are these key antigen-presenting cells, this is how many you get by flow, and this is how many you get by histocytometry. And the overestimate due to uh, the, the way we actually instantiate the cells is about 17%, not tenfold. So it means that you throw away most of these cells you're never going to see them in your single cell analysis because they never get into your machines. So we've done that on a mouse lymph node and identified all the known subpopulations of uh, dendritic cells. And it turns out they don't live randomly mixed in the lymph node. They all have particular regions that they tend to live in. And so these two populations, just call them CDC1 and 2s, there's a population that's central in the T cell zone. And there's a population that's much more peripheral. Well, it turns out they have preferences for how they present antigen to different T cell subpopulations. And this is data that you've not seen before. T cells, the CD4s and CD8 T cells, are not randomly mixed in the paracortical region of the lymph node. The CD4 cells are peripheralized next to the dendritic cells that present preferentially by class 2. The CD8s are more generally concentrated in the central region. That's due to this uh, chemoattractant receptor called EBI2. If we take it out, you lose that preferential positioning of the CD4 T cells. And in a CD8-dependent model of, vac of a malaria vaccine, you lose all the protection. <coughs> if you do all the analysis in vitro that you want, you can't see a difference in EBI2 knockout cells or anything you can measure when you try to activate the T cells. And in vivo, the difference is just a few hour delay in activation because of the search time it takes for the displaced cells now to find the relevant presenting cells, but it plays out in biological uh, ways. You could do all the single cell ex vivo work you want. You'll never understand this principle 
of the immune system or in any other tissue where spatial organization matters. We can visualize human tissues. So here we're looking at uh, germinal centers that are key for making humoral immune responses in multicolor. We can do surface staining for things like PD-1. It identifies what are called TFHs in the light zone, but we can do nuclear staining beautifully, CBCL6, look at all the different cells. This is a 12-color version. The thing lights get very complicated, but we can actually answer functional questions. And again, spatial resolution is going to matter here. It's a very complicated diagram. You don't need to worry about anything except that there are these sort of pink cells called TFRs. These are cells that depress the humoral immune response. There are a few papers in the literature that show a few of those cells in the so-called germinal centers that I just showed you a picture of. And the conclusion is that's where they work because that's where you're generating your humoral immune response. But the question is, where are they actually? Something you can't get from the peripheral blood. So we've looked at human mesenteric lymph nodes in multicolors. If we zoom in into this region, which is on the border or outside of the germinal center, we see plenty of these cells that are Sur surface positive for CD25 and nuclear positive for FOXP3. These are the regula follicular regulatory cells. If you go deep into the germinal center, you occasionally see them. We can do very quantitative data using this method. And when we do that, there are virtually no significant number of these TFRs in the germinal centers. They're all outside. So the notion that they work in that location is incorrect. They actually work by preventing things from doing their job in the germinal center, and again, a conclusion you can't get from isolated cells. We can go further, as I said, you know, 12 plex, 14 plex at a time is not good enough, so there's a very mild stripping method that'll turn this initial picture into this, with this is just being autofluorescence, and then we can do iterative 10 or 12 color stains, and if we keep 10 as new colors and 2 as fiducials for alignment, in a few cycles we're up to super Cytoff levels with very high resolution. But this isn't the only way to do this. And so many of you are familiar with the work from Gary uh, Nolan's lab in uh, a procedure called Cytoff that builds off actually several other previous iterations of how to do this iterative staining. Uh, all of them have drawbacks, and there's some particularly useful things about the way Gary does it using nucleic acid encoding. And they use two or three dyes at a time where all the antibodies are pre-associated uh, with the tissue. And then you come in and you stain with the fluorochromes image, remove them, and there are two or three different chemistries they use for doing that, and then do this again, and image again, and build up the whole pattern. And they have some very nice algorithms that they've already moved out into the, into the cloud to, to actually analyze things. And you can get these very complex patterns using here 20 some odd parameters. And it just begins to show you these distributions. And uh, in the picture that is often used here, they can look at these neighborhoods. Uh, these are very elegant things that are much easier to use in some of our in-lab approaches, but we get similar data. And so there's a problem here, and this has to do with pushing things through at high throughput. If you only do two colors at a time, it actually can take a long time as you get to larger and larger tissue samples to build up these images. We can obviously do a lot better if we're up at 10 or 12 at a time, but we pay a price because we have to develop a complex multicolor panel with spectral overlaps, uh, and that puts certain limitations into the system. So there are pros and cons in each of the different approaches. The histocytometry is valuable. You were talking, and I actually put the slide in after you were, you were speaking, in terms of spatial resolution. So this is not real data in terms of looking at the actual cells, but we've taken the ImGen data and matched up our phenotypic map of cells in the lymph node and basically printed the MGen data bank and we now get a spatial transcriptomic map. It's not cell per cell, but you can get a general map and now when you go back and do it, say with fish or something else, you can ask how does that correlate with the phenotypes of the cells. So it's a very uh, you know, facile way of doing it once you have dense enough phenotyping on the individual cells. But the problem is that's a section and a section grossly undersamples a tissue and so we have developed a new way of doing clearing. There are many clearing methods there, but they all have limitations for doing what I'm about to tell you about. So we have a one-step method that allows you to go to this kind of uh, transparency in multi-millimeters of tissues. And so now you can take a, a, a mouse lymph node. So here we're talking about a, the equivalent of a millimeter biopsy and do this with no se um, sectioning at all in eight to 10 colors at one time. But of course, you can go into that 3D image looking at single cell resolution to do any of the phenotyping I've told you previously in the histocytometry. 
uh, we have, again, like Gary's lab, developed um, algorithms that let us segment these very densely packed cells so we can walk through the volume, go through our flow analyses, and print them back. Now, maybe it's not as pretty as <laughs> Gary's picture, so we're working on that. But, and we can do that, for example, here with human tissues. So this is a human lymph node, and these are now completely intact germinal centers, not the slice I showed you before, where you can get volumetric and total uh, number information about how things are going. And we talked about VR, so we're now translating that into color coding for the individual cells in 3D. And now you can begin to put the glasses on and actually reach in and move around and sort of see where these cells' populations live in three dimensions. It's not just for the immune system, so this is the same clearing technique applied to the brain. And you know, this has to go through another zoom for you to understand that this is a very high resolution method. You can see small spines on these cells, but this is a millimeter thick tissue. So this is very different than the light sheet that's being done for full brain imaging, which is five micron resolution. Here we're talking about submicron resolution in 3D. This is what you get if you want to look in the gut. That was also mentioned today. And this takes a second to run, so I'm going to waste about 12 seconds just letting this show up. But now we're looking in a mouse lung volume. And you'll see some dendritic cells come on in a second. And so you're seeing, again, this in 3D spatial information. Again, we can go into very high resolution. You can see small dendrites in all these cells, individual epithelial cells and they can all be looked at. But we didn't think that was good enough because really you're going to have a lot of RNA data and I'm only looking at proteins. And so we've gotten together with Gary because one of the nice things about the nucleic acid chemistry is it's actually compatible with our clearing method and with fish. And so this is another sample in volume now done using Gary's uh, iterative codex method but our clearing samples. And, you know, when you do it in maximum projection, it's not as pretty as the other example I showed you, but this just takes away and shows you we're going all the way deep at single cell resolution now. So those are completely compatible methods. So this is a 630 micron you know, section out of that. We can go millimeters. So this uh, image and this image are three millimeters apart using some new optics that uh, like and other companies are developing. So we can go to about five millimeters in a practical uh, depth. And this is the thing. We can begin to combine it with fish. Uh, this is a stole from Edo, but I'm not going to go through it because everybody here is familiar with it. But you have subsets that are defined by certain subsets of clustered um, transcripts. So here is multicolor uh, with just a ubiquitin probe. But the interesting thing is this is all compatible with the codex chemistry. And so here we've done iterative staining. This is the B cell follicle area. These green objects are the T cells. And you're going to see that except for a few background dots, all the CD8 is where these T cells concentrate and this group of T cells that I showed you a second ago that were present there. We are still working on iterating the fish in the volume. We can iterate the protein staining and we have no reason to think we can't iterate the fish, but it depends on which method we use. BDNAs have a limitation. HCRs may actually work better. Um, and we haven't tried mere fish, so we don't know whether it's compatible or not. And so if this becomes more bulletproof, and I think that's you know, obviously one of the issues, this is not quite ready for prime time, with a few iterations where you can get the materials in and out of a volume fast enough that in a few days you can collect the imaging data. It's not, it's not a few minutes. Uh, we ought to be able to get up to on the order of 50 to 100 protein markers and an equivalent number of transcripts, which is more than enough for any of the subsetting that comes from doing the single cell data, and I think this is really the goal. So thanks very much. <laughs>